You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Kevin Layton Brown. He is a professor of computer science at the University of British Columbia. Kevin, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Kevin's work involves not only computer science topics such as artificial intelligence, but also game theory and, of course, the intersection between the two. Our topic for today is an app that Kevin co-founded called Kudu, that's K-U-D-U, which uses double auctions to help Ugandan farmers trade more effectively. So, Kevin, my first question to you is, how does a Canadian computer scientist get involved with Ugandan agricultural markets? Well, I guess um, my last sabbatical, which was seven years ago, I really wanted to get interested in uh, research in Africa. I guess I did get interested. I really wanted to get involved. And uh, I really felt like the third world could benefit a lot, both from economic ideas and from uh, artificial intelligence technologies. And I just wanted to find a way to make some kind of impact. And I I didn't think that it was really possible remotely just to sort of drop in and, and make much of a difference. And so I ended up cold calling people, just sort of doing research on the internet and looking around for places that might be a reasonable place to go spend uh, half my sabbatical. And in the end, I guess the the criteria that I I decided I was interested in was somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa, other than South Africa, which had uh, English as the main language and was uh, relatively politically stable and had a good research university. And that left me with uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Ghana. And I, I kind of looked around in all of those places, um, found somebody in Uganda who seemed great. He was my first choice, sent him an email out of the blue, and uh, you know, he invited me to, to come and uh, work there for half a year. And we started all kinds of different projects. We had all kinds of different ideas. And for various reasons, none of them took off. It's just really hard to you know, overcome various kind of institutional barriers to just getting anything working in Africa. You know, it's just the the lack of infrastructure, the lack of you know, partners in government sometimes just can make it really hard to get things working. But you know, of all of the projects we started, the one that survived was Kudu, which is good because it's probably the one that I was the most excited about. And I mean, some of the other ones uh, that didn't survive really was, was occasionally for really orthogonal factors, like we were working with the police, and then at some point the police started shooting protesters before an election, and we decided we didn't want to work with the police anymore. Oh, dear. Or... We, we had a, a project around uh, drug delivery that we had an idea for how people could report counterfeit drugs in their communities. And you know, we set up a meeting with the Ministry of Health people, and then they just never showed up for two consecutive meetings. And so we gave up. So you know, it was just kind of hard to get various things off the ground. But, but Kudu, we could sort of do it ourselves. And uh, we found a, a great partner, Richard Sekambule, who's a, a PhD student at the time um, at the McCarrie University, where I was based working with John Quinn. And you know he really took it on, and so it managed to uh, see the light of day. Interesting. So what's really struck me about this is how you know it's part of your academic career, but it's also extremely entrepreneurial and very directly helps people in the developing world. My main question is, uh, you know, how did you discover the need for this? You know, how did you figure out? that the agricultural markets could be improved? The, the first kind of inklings that I had was just being a consumer uh, of agricultural produce in Uganda. Uh, I was just living in a sort of regular apartment building in the neighborhood near the university, uh, Wandegea in Kampala, Uganda. And so I just you know went to buy my vegetables where everyone there did, which was just by uh, little roadside vendors who would, would lay vegetables out on a sheet and you would just kind of go up and, and point at what you wanted and bargain for it. And I was struck that from one day to the next, certain things just wouldn't be available. You know, there would be no tomatoes one day. And, you know, Uganda is an equatorial country where 80% of the population is engaged in agriculture. So this isn't because tomatoes were expensively imported from Italy or something. And when we went to the north to go see a national park or visit colleagues at another place or something. Once you got out of the city, very shortly you would see these roadside kiosks where locals would come by to sell vegetables and there would be huge stacks of tomatoes and and nobody um, stopping to to buy them. 
And you would think, you know, wow, it must be so depressing for these people to sit here by the side of the road all day and, and get no business. And you know, they're not at home working their farms. And then you're in the city and you're thinking, I want to buy some tomatoes and there's nothing to be found. And, you know, this is uh, market inefficiency, which is the starting point for often thinking that an economic intervention might make sense. Because, you know, something is going badly wrong in the market when there are, on the one hand, consumers and on the other hand, producers who would like to find each other. That, that doesn't automatically show that a solution like Kudu would, uh, would be the right thing to do, but it does show that you know, maybe this is worth thinking more about. Right. So the, the first project that Richard and John and I started thinking about was trying to estimate the value of arbitrage opportunities in uh, agriculture. Really hard to know anything like this for sure, uh, because the data underlying is, is uh, you know, really patchy. But you know, we looked at a bunch of uh, your data gathered by NGOs in Uganda about the market prices for three staples, matoke, which is plantains, which is one of the main foods people eat in Uganda, and maize, which is like cornmeal, and beans. And we, for each of them, figured out you know, how much they cost at different times in different places. And then we asked about both temporal and spatial arbitrage. So we said, you know, if I was to buy a bunch of dried beans and rent a warehouse and pay a security guard and pay a fumigator to keep pests away and then plan to sell it some number of months later, you know, for example, to buy it at the harvest and to sell it shortly before the next harvest or something like that. Um, you know, could I find a reliable pattern in the data that would make me money even with all these costs? Or for spatial arbitrage, I could say, could I buy, you know, Matoke in one location and rent a 13 ton truck and rent a driver and pay for gas and take it from this place to this other place and sell it? And, you know, again, is there some kind of reliable way in the data that I could make money doing this? And what we found was you could make pretty ridiculous amounts of money pretty reliably, sort of 20 to 40% return on investment over the course of three or four months um, using some of these strategies. And I was at a party in Uganda that was attended mostly by Ugandans while I was there. And I was mentioning these early results uh, just randomly to somebody that I was talking to. And the guy looked so concerned. And he said, don't tell anybody about this. This is my livelihood. This is what I do. Mm. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, what I said to him was, you know, it, it's great that you do this, but you're not doing it well enough to arbitrage the price differences away because I can still see them. So, you know, the market is still not working efficiently because of what you're doing. And really, in the end, you know, this just showed that something was going horribly wrong in the market. It didn't, didn't say what the solution was, but it said that we really needed, you know, the, the market needed something very different to improve uh, search and to help match buyers and sellers. Yeah, if, if, I think if I observe something like this happening in, say, Canada, I would, I would expect that it wasn't you know, an in informational problem. I'd, I'd maybe assume that there's some regulation preventing you know, certain goods from being sold at certain prices in, you know, within the city. Or, that would be a sensible yeah. thing to think in Canada, yeah. Mm -hmm. because, because our markets work <laughs> fairly well. And so if you see some you know, persistent arbitrage opportunity, it's probably because there's some barrier, often a legal barrier. For instance, we have very expensive milk in the United States. It's very cheap. And you know, why don't people just load up trucks full of milk and drive across the border? Well, it's illegal. So, mm -hmm. uh, But at least in Uganda. That's a good point. I mean, I, I was mm -hmm. thinking as you, was you were talking, almost – we have almost no experience with giant arbitrage opportunities. It's sort of a weird thing to even imagine. But you're right, kind of transborder examples are probably the, the strongest ones where buying gas or buying milk or something in the United States is just vastly cheaper. And people know this. And when they travel, they, they bring a certain amount with them. Right. Up to the legal limit. Uh, yeah, actually, you right. know, it reminds me of uh, David Ricardo, the, uh, the 19th century economist. We all know him for uh, comparative advantage. But he actually amassed a huge fortune just basically seizing arbitrage opportunities in 19th century Europe. So at, at least then there were arbitrage opportunities in Europe, what was uh, not developed at all by our standards, but uh, was fairly wealthy part of the world relatively at the time. And, you know, it, it's just interesting to see academics doing this and, and seizing these opportunities and, and doing something about them. So let's see, where, where you are in the story, you were trying to measure arbitrage. 
So uh, I do want to stress that just because there was an arbitrage opportunity here doesn't mean that it was a kind of robust arbitrage opportunity. I'm not sure that it would have been worth trading on. It might well have been. But we didn't look back you know, over that huge a course of time. And Uganda is a volatile place. So you know, it might be that you could make money for years doing this, and then there would be a, you know, a political instability and it would wipe you out. Or it might be that the cost of capital is really high. Or it could be that you know, the risk of crime is much bigger than we modeled and that you know, that would wipe you out on average. Or it, there could be various reasons why you know, just because you see an arbitrage opportunity here doesn't actually mean you, know, you should be the one to go fix that arbitrage opportunity by actually doing the trade that we're modeling. But instead, this is just sort of a diagnostic that says, you know, something is horribly wrong if, in principle, you could have done this. You know, th this should really make you wonder about how this market is working. Yeah. So, and I mean, just to get to the basics of why this is inefficient, you have tomatoes in the countryside where they're not very valuable and there aren't many people buying them. And maybe a lot of them are just going to go to waste. They're going to rot before they even find a buyer. And then you have people, you know, willing buyers in the city willing to pay a high price. And by just moving a tomato from one place to another, a place where it's not valuable to where it is valuable, you create a lot of value. And there's, there's an opportunity there that's not being seized. So that's where the market inefficiency comes from. How did you arrive at the decision to make an app for it? Let me say one more thing about uh, the inefficiency uh, and transition to that. I, I completely agree with what you just said, but to underscore it, uh, it's worth you know, recognizing the wealth disparities in a place like Uganda, because they're also unfamiliar to us in the West. I mean, Uganda is a remarkably safe, friendly, functional society, but nevertheless, there are just phenomenal wealth disparities. So I might get these numbers wrong, but I, I think that uh, in 2010, when I was there, over 40% of Ugandans didn't have access to electricity. And a pretty large fraction, like maybe a quarter, were, were earning less than $2 a day. So it's pretty possible that that person growing tomatoes is a person for whom $2 means something phenomenally different than it does to me, who's you know willing to spend that to buy those tomatoes. So and not only is there this gap, but it's a gap that could really affect people's livelihood and really their, their economic security. So let me tell you another statistic that I think is interesting. I said 40% of people don't have electricity, but at the time, only something like a quarter of people didn't have a cell phone. So amazingly, there are dramatically more Ugandans with cell phones than with electricity, which of course invites the question of how they charge their cell phones. And there are actually little entrepreneurial kiosks in the slums where you can you can pay somebody just 75 cents or something to leave your phone with them for a while, and, and they'll uh, charge it up for you from a generator. So you're pretty amazing, but, but phones are everywhere. So power is pretty unreliable, and uh, you know, landlines are non-existent, but pretty much everybody's got one or more phones. You know, you can buy a SIM card for 50 cents, you can buy you know, airtime by the minute in increments as cheap as 50 cents. You know, the caller pays, so you know, people will phone each other, say a couple of words, and then hang up. And if the other person wants to say any more, they have to phone back and pay themselves. It's amazing, but it's really just penetrated everywhere. And it's really changed commerce in a lot of ways, just in simple ways. So taxi drivers used to sit around in taxi stands all day, hoping somebody would just come up and drive them somewhere. And, and they still do. The taxi stands still exist. But often, if you pick up a driver from the taxi stand, they'll say, Here's my phone number. Call me day or night, and I'll just come get you, even if I'm not working in the taxi stand. And this is great for the drivers because instead of spending hours sitting around, they can be with their family and they can just still come and get their customers. So you know, this kind of cell phones coming into uh, Ugandan society and really changing the the sort of nature of labor is uh, is really kind of a big thing. It's really a, a a very transformative technology there. Probably even more than it is for us here because the, mm. the gap is bigger. You know, this is sort of modern telecommunications as compared to, you know, a British era postal service, basically. <laughs> there sort of wasn't something in between. Right. Yeah. I remember reading about just how much cell phones have penetrated into the poorest parts of the world. And yeah, it's like here, I've had a PC since you know, the 90s, I've had one in my household since, you know, as my earliest memories, my family had a PC. And the cell phone is more, you know, the smartphone is basically just for internet access when I'm on the bus or, you know, too lazy to get off mm -hmm. the couch and walk to where my PC is. 
And so it's like a marginal change here. But if you went from no PC to having a smartphone that could access the internet, you know, one, one can just imagine that even for a very poor person, it's not a luxury, it's an investment. And if they can justify that investment, like your taxi driver can, or I, I suppose we, we could imagine, you know, a farmer, if they just had access to Wikipedia, you know, <laughs> or just Google, the best way to grow this crop could save themselves a lot of trouble trying to just reinvent the wheel. Well, so it turns out you're aiming a little high here. Mm. And the, the gap between what, what you're imagining happens and what really does happen is sort of the main thing that makes our technology interesting. So let me explain to you uh, what's different. Basically, nobody has a smartphone. I've pretty much not seen smartphones in Uganda except for the unlocked iPhone that I brought with me. Okay. What people have is like Nokia 9140s, like a black and white LCD phone that kind of looks like a remote control for your, uh, your stereo and has you know, four lines of 20 column text. Okay. So, so it's just calls. It could maybe access like very basic things on the internet maybe it's calls and text messages basically. calls and texts okay. I, I mean the, the 3g network isn't bad you can actually get pretty decent data in uganda all data plans are you buy a certain amount of um you know gigabytes of data and you use it up and then you have to refill it and as a result there's an economic interest in getting people to use it as quickly as possible so I actually get better data throughput in kampala than i get in vancouver but not many people use it that's pretty expensive for people and the hardware is also pretty expensive but it's really just, you know, having phone connectivity at all that is changing things. You know, my taxi driver doesn't use some kind of crazy app. He really just, you know, I phone him <laughs> and talk to him in person. And it, that's probably changing now. There's probably, you know, more smartphone penetration now than there was. But I, I think, you know, if you go out into the rural areas, farmers aren't, you know, looking things up on Wikipedia. They're phoning their brother who lives in the city and saying, you know, what did maize sell for today? Okay. Or, you know, I need, I need to ship my products to market. You know, is it better to send it to Kampala or to Gulu or to Jinja? You know, it's just this really kind of basic telecommunication stuff that we take for granted, but that is, is making a tremendous difference. And it's a little bit more than phoning people because there are text messages and text messages can be pretty powerful. So something that is quite popular in Uganda that might seem a bit undesirable to us here is you can pay for subscription services where you get multiple text messages a day on some topic or another. So if you care about a football team, they'll tell you, you know, how Arsenal did in the playoffs. Or if you care about the weather, you know, you'll get a, a text every day telling you something about the weather. So basically you can sign up for these broadcast services that just tell you something you're interested in knowing. And some of them are free and some of them are not. But this means that, you know, you get the sort of benefit of broadcast internet kinds of services without without needing really any kind of sophisticated device. Okay. And, and text messages in Uganda cost something like two cents a message. So I'm starting to see the sort of the outline of your app. You have these fairly poorly functioning markets in Uganda for agricultural products. You have these arbitrage opportunities, probably owing to a lack of information. And you have... 75% of people with these basic phones. Now, when I first read about Kudu, I was picturing like an iPhone app. I was, I was picturing something fancy, you know, not super fancy, but you know, like Tinder or something. <laughs> but, uh, but so it sounds like you needed to do something that worked with these very basic technology that everyone has. So, so tell me uh, how you arrived there. So the, the fundamental question that we had was, you know, how do I run a combination of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and Craigslist? You know, I'm selling commodities, but between individual people where the person I transact with might matter to me because of location and reputation and quantity. How do I do this sort of commodity market classified system running over SMS? So right. kind of easy to see how you would do something like this over a regular computer. You know, you would do something, you know, a little bit like eBay maybe would be your first cut. Or, or maybe you would dispense with it and you would just use something like Craigslist. The problem is, what do you do when there's absolutely no browsing? Right? If I really imagine I've got you know, a, a display that has 20 characters wide and, and four rows of text deep, how would you imagine browsing eBay or Craigslist on a device like that? And 
given that we're going to be paying for the text messages because otherwise nobody will use our service, um, we're paying two cents a text message, which pretty cheap, but it adds up if people are sending thousands of text messages to get anything done. So this was really the, the kind of core question. How can we elicit information from people about what they want to buy or sell and where they are and, and ultimately you know, help them to find people they want to trade with in a really informationally restricted kind of way? And, and so what we ended up with, I'm kind of drawing on uh, pretty straightforward ideas from economics, is to have some kind of auction market that would take bids from people and then would do some kind of centralized matching. It would decide, you know, it looks like this person and this other person, you know, would make sense as trading partners. Let's propose them to each other. And then you're only having to send one message. You're not saying, here's everybody with, you know, Matoke to sell in the, you know, bottom third of the country, see where you want to go drive. It just says, you know, here's a potential trade that makes sense. And th that includes a proposed price and, you know, the location of the person and everything you would need to know. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, the design has undergone a lot of uh, revision since then, but, but that's the, the core idea that you know, we really want to use the idea of a market and kind of decentralize clear of a market to dramatically reduce the amount of information that people would otherwise need to find out about everything that's going on. So do people need to text you, you know, wh what goods they have or what goods they want and at what price? Right. So... As we initially built the system, the, I mean, it's all computerized. So you send a text message that's sort of formatted in a particular way that, you know, something very simple, like buy Matoke, you know, a thousand units for this price per unit. And you send that text message and then the system knows that you exist. And well, I mean, you've registered with the system before. It already knows what your phone number is. It knows um, your geographical location based on your phone number. You place a bid like that and then... At some point in the future, we do a periodic clear of the market. We decide, here's a, a counterparty that you might want to trade with. And then we send a, a subsequent text message to you and say, you know, hey, we found somebody. You know, here are the characteristics of this person. Do you want to trade? Okay. So so do you, when, when you're putting in your bid, do you put in a, uh, a lowest price you're willing to accept or a highest price you're willing to pay? Well, right. So now we're getting into the sort of economic market design as we should. So you'll know the uh, Meyerson satterthwaite theorem mm -hmm. that says that a, a, a two-sided market can't be, what is it, budget balanced and efficient and individually rational. And, and you know, what that means in practice is that, that we can't have uh, dominant strategy incentive compatibility on both sides of the market. We also can't be efficient. But we can't find some way of pricing things that's going to make, make the market make sense to everyone. So what we do is we second price the buyers the kind of traders who are the ones with the truck that's actually going to show up and buy the, the goods. So they, they specify a bid, which is the maximum amount that they would be prepared to pay. And we, we first price the sellers. So the sellers specify what they would be willing to pay, or so to be paid, just kind of as a, as a posted price, just sort of a, a paradigm that they're used to anyway. And the reason that we set the market up this way is that you know, from our kind of interviews with people, it seems as though buyers have dramatically more market power than uh, sellers do, partly because buyers are more mobile. I mean, they own a truck. They have enough capital to have bought a truck. And they're the ones taking the financial risk and also the kind of undergoing the effort of actually driving out to wherever the seller is. They have better access to information because they're based in the center, so they, they learn more about what's going on in the market. So basically, we want to make the market as attractive to these people as possible. So we want to give them a really compelling strategic problem, which is, you know, you just tell us a number, we're going to come back to you with a lower number. Okay. Uh, that's, that's what it does. And so, so it isn't necessarily the case that a seller will always uh, be paid exactly the price that he offers, because sometimes second pricing means that, you know, if I've got one seller and two buyers, the buyers end up competing with each other over the seller. So rather than paying the seller's price, the buyer might end up paying a different buyer's price, you know, the buyer who didn't get to trade. Okay. Yeah, the Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem uh, is something I learned for uh, to pass my comprehensive exams, but uh, haven't really thought much about since. It's one of these things where uh, Vernon Smith and and experimental economists have, I think, more or less falsified when you when you get people together in a lab and you you know you have them trade with each other, you can get very close to to perfect efficiency and. Uh, 
in these, uh, you know, two-sided auctions. I've actually personally run a lot of two-sided auction experiments. And uh, mm-hmm. for the most part, you get a bunch of undergrads who have never traded before calling out bids and asks. And, and you can get consistently over 90% efficiency. Often you, you get it perfect and, and get 100% efficiency. Sure, which, which is absolutely consistent with the theorem, right? It's just saying that you can't, that you know, no mechanism guarantees this, right? Yes. You know, we we see this kind of uh, thing in in computer science too, where you know you get a negative result that says something or other isn't always possible, and then you know you get an empirical finding that says you know yeah, but you can get really close to to that good level of performance kind of all the time. It, it's virtually impossible to find a non contrived case where you don't. Um, so right. so that that definitely could be true here. I have to say that uh, you know we started really motivated by these kinds of market design questions, but in the end, people are really not that willing to trade at the prices that we propose to them, and they're really not that familiar with the idea of a market mechanism. You know, I mean, bear in mind this is a country where the end customer of the tomatoes, you know, the the random professor from Canada who's buying them by the side of the road in Kampala, doesn't even face a fixed price, <laughs> right? So right. there is this kind of haggling, price discovery kind of culture where just being told something by a system that people are a bit resistant to. So I think at the end of the day, we take our market design with a bit of a grain of salt. But what's really important is the role that it plays in, in matching and just sort of recognizing that a trade is feasible. So right. you know, if we don't have any meaningful information about people, we don't have anything we can use to match people. So once we do match people, Maybe they decide to trade somewhat differently than than we told them to. Maybe the price moves in the time it takes the truck to drive across Uganda or something. That's less important to us than just facilitating trade in the first place. Right. So, you know, once the system is connected to people and the guy with his truck is driven to where the person has all their tomatoes, you know, you know, based on their bids, that what the person's willing to pay for tomatoes is higher than what the, the seller is willing to sell for and so there's a potential opportunity there to trade but they may haggle up or down in um from what the the price the system suggested that's right so so basically the the entire journey of our system from kind of conception to the the reality where it's operating in Uganda today has been one of me gradually shedding economic orthodoxies that I came into this experience with so you know the, and the thing that has been sort of the hardest for me to let go of that, that I still haven't completely let go of is the idea that bids are binding commitments because you know any economic theorist will tell you that if bids aren't binding then your whole market kind of unravels then nothing means anything hmm. and that's sort of true <laughs> you, know, you do have to sort of worry about that you, you do want the bids to have some kind of force and I guess the the force that bids have for us is that you know you won't be matched if you make a, a ridiculous bid and, and that furthermore there isn't much good reason for you to want to be sneaky with your bid because the the underlying incentives in the market are pretty sensible. But at the same time, you know, negotiation is really important. Th- there are various factors that are pretty hard for us to think about. You know, our our system isn't good enough to know whether the dirt road that gets to this village just washed out and it's incredibly difficult to drive up the muddy hill for two and a half hours in you know your semi trailer to get to the place where you have to buy the the beans and you know, the people on the ground can do a better job of figuring this sort of thing out than we can. So, you know, at the end of the day, what we really care about is making trade happen that would otherwise not have happened. And, you know, it's like <laughs> something that uh, in the last sort of six months we've been grappling with that sort of breaks my heart that it's true is that we've actually, we now have a call center. We have sort of a half dozen people sort of sitting there in a room with phones and people call in and people have found the the SMS interface too inflexible. They're not used to sort of texting a computer, they're used to texting a person, so they'll send these badly formatted text strings that just say something that's like a sentence rather than, you know, buy Matoki number of units amount or something. And so then somebody will phone them back and walk them through it. You know, they've told us, you know, we think some trades are uh, are getting left on the table because the, the seller says a price that's too high and the buyer says a price that's too low. So, so it, you know, they're actually infeasible trades <laughs> from the point of view of the, the bids that were specified. Because people are sort of testing out the system, I don't know, and they just you know can't be persuaded of this sort of logic of second pricing. So we've actually started mm. finding sort of minimally infeasible trades and saying, 
you know, here's a trade where one person said something a little bit too low and one person said something a little bit too high. But, you know, if one of you changes your mind, there might be a room to meet in the middle. And those trades have actually even started sometimes going through. So that, that's certainly not what you would expect <laughs> from kind of a, a market design problem. But, you know, we're dealing with uh, illiterate farmers uh, <laughs> you know, who, who've never really interacted with a formalized market like this before. So we're really having to be very flexible. Yeah. So I'm interested in lots of aspects of this system. So let's say there were, you know, two buyers and two sellers and you could pair them, you know, either seller one with buyer A or seller one with buyer B, you know, the other way around. Does the system prioritize people who are physically near to each other? Is, is there, you know, how, how does that work? So every question like this gets sort of ferociously complicated in its details. Um, we, we would <laughs> like to prioritize um, people who are close to each other because you know, anyone who has spent you know, a day trying to get somewhere in rural Uganda you know, gains an appreciation for how far short distances are on pockmarked, um, muddy dirt roads on the side of a hill. You can make maybe 10 kilometers an hour. So you know, it makes a pretty big difference how far... Uh, you send somebody. Okay. On the other hand, people are prepared to, to travel pretty long distances. Uh, sorry, you were saying something? Yeah, uh, 10 kilometers an hour is about how fast you go on Hastings Street at rush hour. So, I mean. Well, there's that problem <laughs> too. So, Uganda has the same population as Canada, and uh, something like 120th uh, of the surface area. Mm. And it has a couple of highways that have two lanes, I think. And virtually everything is one lane roads with sort of no traffic lights, but, you know, people and goats and things sort of walking out onto the road. So it's not exactly uh, the Trans-Canada Highway either. Okay. So you also do get this problem that, you know, people bottleneck in the urban areas and the, the traffic jams can be pretty, pretty ferocious. But, you know, I guess the drivers, um, you know, make their livings driving. And, uh, well, I guess the, the other problem they have is nobody wants to drive at night because uh, bandits will stop your car and uh, rob you. <laughs> so, oh dear. This, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, problems that we really don't face, and on the other hand, problems that are really familiar of just sort of overwhelmed infrastructure. Yeah. Another yeah. thing that's worth knowing is that gas in Uganda costs more than it does in Canada, because Uganda has to import gas, and uh, Uganda does not export much. And so it's tough for African countries to get their hands on gas. It's expensive. And this means that uh, people are pretty conservative about uh, driving. Uh, driving is a, a bigger expense, uh, relatively speaking, for a Ugandan than for a Canadian. And, uh, you know, it's not absolutely prohibitive, but it's something people think carefully about. So all of this is to say, when we, when we look at a trade, we want to estimate to the best we can, you know, what would this trade cost for the participants to execute? So if I'm proposing to somebody they should drive a really long way, I've got to think that it's a pretty good trade and that there's nobody else who could benefit from the same trade by driving a shorter distance. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty hard to have an exactly accurate sort of roadmap, but we have some data from the UN that's pretty good. We know which are sort of primary and secondary and tertiary roads, so we, we can get some kind of speed estimates. We have sort of course estimates of the mileage costs in urban areas and in rural areas, idling in a traffic jam versus actually moving. We have some estimates of you know, how much a truck driver makes an hour, you know, how much that's going to cost. And so all of this sort of factors into our estimate of whether a trade is a good one. And there are error bars on all these figures, which, you know, is another reason why it's hard to make this into an exact science. Yeah, I, it seems like when you move out of theory and into the real world, man, the real world is just so messy. <laughs> There's just so many things to to think about. So you, you I mean, mentioned another thing that you would get from economic theory is that you would want to elicit some of this information from people. You know, you'd like mm. to even just know something like, are you the kind of person who's willing to drive across the country, or are you looking for things that are near you? And yet, what we're persistently finding from our users is they just don't want to tell us anything, and and they find you know any interactions with the system you know in of that form of kind of telling us things about their preferences confusing and off-putting. So we're really stuck guessing at a lot of these sorts of properties, which, which is a tricky thing. Yeah, I run economics experiments, and you know sometimes we ha have some sort of uh, strange mechanisms for eliciting what people's preferences or, or people's beliefs, and uh, you know at least we're paying them to be there, and they signed up for it, and they're 
Western undergraduates who are prepared to be asked some weird questions. But yeah, I can I can imagine that it would it would be off putting. Uh, you know, why do you want to know this? Uh, you know, this information about uh, about my travel preferences. You you mentioned that some trades are going through, you know, in, in different circumstances. How do you know if a trade has gone through? Is it recorded through the app? Well, that's a great question. So there, there are various different levels at which we can know such a thing. You know, we know when a trade has been proposed. You know, that's just something that the system does. But once we've proposed a trade, we've basically given cell phone numbers of a buyer and a seller to each other and said, you know, here's what you each have. Here's what you've each told us. Seems to us like you would be good candidates for trade. You know, are you interested in this trade? Yes or no. And you text back, yes. But then we don't know whether the guy actually drove his truck across Uganda and picked up the beans. We just know that, you know, they said they were interested. You know, it's not like a Bitcoin transaction. You know, somebody actually has to show up with the money, pick up the beans. So we've actually been partnering with some economics researchers at the um, UCLA and uh, Berkeley, who are development economists who work in uh, trying to you know, make these kinds of empirical measurements in developing countries and just really trying to understand you know, what exactly is going on. So we've sort of bootstrapped one of their existing projects. That's how we're able to um, now afford a call center and how you know, we have uh, as big a footprint in Uganda as we have. So they actually have a team of researchers that's based in Uganda that individually contacts people that look like they were matched in the system and verifies with them over the phone that a trade really happened. So we actually have survey data from them that gives us sort of a lower bound on, on how much of an impact the system is having in Uganda because they, they literally painstakingly go out and verify every transaction. And, and that's a good thing to do if you're a researcher and you kind of want to estimate what effect your system is having. Completely unsustainable for a market. It's not something we're eventually going to do. So in the end, it's going to be hard to know what trades happen and what trades don't. I think you know the, the ordinary operation of our market is not going to make it easy to verify this sort of thing. As a side effect of running the system, we gather a lot of data about what people would be willing to, to buy, to pay to buy and sell various commodities in various places in Uganda. And one function of the system is that we broadcast this information out to anybody who wants it. And as far as we can tell, this is by far our most popular feature. So I don't exactly understand why you wouldn't want automatic matching with, you know, other interested people who might want to buy what you're selling, but the main thing farmers want from us is reliable information about the going price for, for a given thing, because you know they'll come into contact with traders who will just demand a completely ridiculous price, and they'll not know better, and then they'll discover that they got you know horribly taken for a ride. And so access to frequently updated real-time data about prices is really valuable to them. And uh, to the point where we went out to villages on a, a recent field visit and uh, met with farmers who actually used our system. And some of them kind of thought Kudu was a price advisory system. That, that just was so fundamental to them in the way that they were using it, that that was you know, essentially what the word meant to them. And uh, that's really something we can't measure. I mean, it, it might well be that for every trade that happens on our system, there are 10 or 20 people who are benefiting from the prices and trading off the system. And we just can't know that. Right. Okay. So... Not only do people know what what a fair trade is, you know, if they're if they're being taken for a ride, if they're someone's trying to cheat them, they would know that spatially, I presume. So if you know the best price they can get their, for their tomatoes where they are is fairly low, but they could look on the app and see, oh, the prices are really high, you know, half hour drive from here, they themselves could you know load up all their tomatoes and go somewhere else, presumably. It's not so much about facilitating arbitrage. It's it's more just about you know, if you live in the north, close to the border with South Sudan, where there's a famine going on at the moment, then, you know, food prices might be very different from if you live, you know, in the south, close to the border with Kenya, which is a relatively large, stable economy. And, you know, the roads between them are terrible, which might justify a sort of persistent price difference. So it might just be that if you live in the north, prices close to the Kenyan border are pretty meaningless to you. And uh, it's just helpful to get sort of geographically scoped information. I mean, again, most of these farmers, like, they literally don't own a vehicle. So they don't really have the opportunity to go somewhere else. 
Right. But if you knew that there was a different price 10 minutes away, then the guy you're, you're selling to, you could show him that and say, you know, I know you can get this price or, you know, this is the uh, somewhere else. Exactly. So this might help you to be better informed about, you know, what your counterparty is already thinking and, and you know, might allow you to recognize the market power that you have. Yeah, right. So yeah, the information asymmetry is, is uh, corrected by distributing information to everyone, essentially making it public information. That's right. And I mean, not only are farmers mostly illiterate and pretty enumerate and really poor, they're also trading really occasionally. Um, you know, they harvest all of their crops and they, they might sell, you know, like a small scale farmer might only sell once a season. So there, there are two seasons in Uganda. So it's because it's on the equator. So they might only be selling like a couple of times a year. So you know, they might just be really out of date in terms of who should I be trading with, what's happened in the market in the last half of a year. I mean, obviously, it's an agricultural country, so this is what people talk about and care about. But still, you get a lot of conflicting information. You know, if you're selling a house and you're dealing with a real estate agent, they're just so much better informed than you are about what the market is doing. And should I wait? Should I sell now? You know, this kind of thing. You know, it would really help to have better information. So you mentioned earlier that you pay the two cents for the text messages when people submit their bids and asks, and you operate a call center. Is this something, do you fund it entirely through grants, or is there some kind of income side to this? At this point, we're funding it entirely through grants. The operating costs are fairly low. Um, most of our staff are Ugandan, and salaries are, are pretty low in Uganda, Um we pay some telecommunication services. We use sort of we buy bulk text messages, and we have a computer cluster running in Canada that does the market clearing. And you know, most of the staff doing kind of development work is researchers who don't have to be paid at all. You know, in the end, this is obviously not a sustainable model, although it's it's more sustainable than you might think, given how low our costs are. But eventually, the aim is to make this a for profit service, not really because we want to make money ourselves from it, but because in Uganda, it's just kind of clear when you spend some time there that the for-profit services are the ones that actually survive. There are a lot of richly funded charity, non-governmental organizations that just spend a lot of money and don't achieve much and eventually kind of move on and don't have a lasting impact. And people there are just really cynical about it. It's very sad to see. But, you know, charitable aid had some huge successes in Africa, but it's also had just a lot of disappointing failures. And it's really hard to see, you know, how to make that model succeed. Whereas the kind of private enterprise model tends to be more sustainable, it tends to be longer lived and eventually to deliver benefits to people. So really, especially having listened to our Ugandan partners, we, we really believe that this is the, the way of building something at the scale that can serve the whole country that can be around in the long term. In terms of how we would make money, we have various different kind of revenue uh, models that you know, we've uh, given thought to that we can imagine using. We're not exactly sure which one we'll eventually adopt. Um, we can imagine charging subscriptions for um, price broadcasts, for example. We could imagine charging very large-scale buyers for sort of premium access and hand-holding on the system and letting small participants just trade freely forever. We can imagine a model where we partner with local organizations, uh, as we already do today, who are physically in the villages to sort of help facilitate trades and make a kind of basic version of the system freely available to everyone, but then allow some kind of surcharge where you get quality certification by this trusted intermediary and uh, you, you pay some kind of premium on the trade to them. And we would take a fraction of that. You know, fundamentally, I think if you're increasing efficiency and you know money is passing through your system, being able to to capture some small fraction of that to, to keep the thing solvent ought not to be a hard problem. Uh, right now, we're really focused on growth. Right, and if you're in getting invested, if you're a farmer and you're you're learning to use this system, and that has some cost to you, and I think you'd want to have some confidence that it was going to be around. You know in the future for you to keep using and knowing it's profitable would give you that confidence. That's probably true. I mean, we've actually found people to be remarkably willing to experiment, you know, more so than, than people here would be. Um, 
I think at the end of the day, this is somebody's livelihood. You know, if you're telling them, try this thing out for a few minutes, you know, you never know, you might find a better price for the, the crops that you've spent half a year growing. People are willing to take a chance on it and see if, you know, given that there's no risk to them except time, um, they're willing to try it out. The, the bigger issue is just getting the thing to operate at scale. You know, like any two-sided market, it's more and more interesting the more people are using it. So it's really hard to bootstrap a market through its initial phases because you know, the sellers are not interested. And if you've got a market with no sellers, the buyers are not interested. So, you know, right now we're really engaged in that painstaking growing of the market to the point where it becomes more and more valuable to people on both sides. Do you have any closing thoughts, anything we didn't cover that you feel listeners should know or would be interested in? Maybe I'll say just a, a couple of high-level things. I mean, one thing that we haven't spoken about that I would like to say is that the system, it's not as big and well-established as we'd like it to be, but it actually exists and is being used. Um, we've had something like one and a half million dollars US in confirmed trades in the last kind of year, year and a half. So, I mean, I'm, I'm excited that we've turned this corner of actually having built something that people are really using and trading real money on. I told you this began in 2010, so it's been a long road for us to get to this point. I guess the other thing that, that we've talked about only kind of implicitly, but that I, I just want to sort of throw out to your audience, is that computer science questions are at the core of a lot of this. So Although I work with a lot of economists and I, I have exposure to economics, you know, I teach a, a game theory course online and, and so on, I'm not an economist. And there's a reason why computer scientists do this stuff. Something we didn't talk about, but which uh, you know, anyone who gives a little bit of thought to this will realize, is the problem of clearing a market like this is pretty complicated. This is not like clearing the New York Stock Exchange. Geography matters. Everyone has supply constraints. You know, you can only put so much beans in a truck before the truck is full. There are reputational limits. So when we actually look at everything and, and try to decide, you know, what are the Victory Clark Groves prices uh, that we want to offer to the buyers in this market? What trades are even feasible? This is a, a pretty daunting combinatorial optimization problem that runs on a computer cluster. So if we start asking, you know, richer questions like, uh, what if I want to allow a seller, uh, sorry, a buyer to stop in multiple places rather than to stop in one place so that he can accumulate a bunch of nearby small bundles uh, together to fill up a truck. That only gets more computationally complicated. And all of this really has underneath it um, interesting computer science questions. I guess another one is, given that people are willing to tell us so little about their preferences, there's a machine learning problem of looking at which trades actually happen and which trades don't happen and uh, and using all of that data that we've seen before to build a model of how much people care about bid staleness, uh, counterparty reliability, distance traveled, quantity mismatches, having to make multiple stops. So you know all of these questions really show, I think, a, a new direction that uh, economics broadly and certainly market design in particular is taking of of putting computational questions really at the forefront of thinking about markets. My guest today has been Kevin Layton Brown. Kevin, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Great, thanks very much. It's been really nice to talk to you.